we here tonight happen to be Baptists, Catholics, Episcopalians, Lutherans, Orthodox, Mennonites, Messianic believers, denominational Pentecostals, Presbyterians, United Methodists, non-denominational people, and many, many more. And you know, we don't exactly have a reputation over the generations for mutual love, unity, and brotherhood. Jesus said, I do not pray for these only, but also for those who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. You see, for the world to believe depends on our becoming one. Inasmuch as we are divided, that is a serious scandal that undermines Christ's work and makes the preaching of the gospel unbelievable in the world. And I tend to think because of our division and separation, God has poured out his Holy Spirit with all the graces and gifts. We are here tonight truly one in the Spirit. And what we have experienced is not coming upon us to set us apart as the charismatics, but is coming upon the whole church, the whole body of Christ, so that the whole church in every corner, in every congregation, in every assembly may be thoroughly and totally filled with the Spirit and equipped with every spiritual grace and gift needed to be the body of Christ in an effective, world-changing way in today's society. And tonight, the people of the Spirit are coming together, flowing together, the work of the Spirit is meeting up with work of the Spirit, and power of the Spirit is meeting up with power of the Spirit. And now, tonight, it is all coming together like a mighty river thundering across this Arrowhead Stadium waterfall, and it will flow forth from this stadium and from this conference. It will flow out of here as a mighty river and it will burst across the face of the nation and indeed this world as we go forth from here, a newly united people. In what may well be the largest grassroots ecumenical event in hundreds of years, the people of God have come together in one prophetic action to proclaim within the church in many ways, unity is already here, and fuller unity is coming. Morning conferences were held throughout Kansas City so that members of each denomination and fellowship might more clearly receive God's word and teaching and promote the renewal of their own churches. Those who have been divided for centuries came together in love to express their desire to be one, that the world may believe Jesus is Lord.
When we went to South America for the first time in the year 1925, according to mission policies at that time, we had the Methodists to one side and the Pentecostals to the other side and the Catholics all around us, of course. We turned the Pentecostals off early because they treated us rather condescendingly. They told us they had the power and we didn't, and so on, so on. Of course, we didn't waste much love on each other as far as the Catholics went. We were, they, we were a threat to them. Uh, they imagined, perhaps rightly so, we came to steal sheep. So I repeat, we did not waste much love on each other. I only have three minutes. I want to know whether applause counts. <laughs> God created man according to his image and likeness. Man and woman, he created him. That's why there is that great longing between man and woman. Far beyond sex. Sex comes, stays a while, and slowly drifts away. But that longing always stays. Because we are one whole and the one half is longing for the other. And we are one in the spirit, we are one in the Lord, and we proclaim to the world, we make one statement tonight, we are here because we are one in the spirit. I want you just to lift your right hand. And I want them to hear you way down at the Mulebach Hotel. I want them to hear you say holiness. holiness. It's my pleasure to give to you now the greatest holiness preacher in the world, Bishop J.O. Patterson, presiding bishop of the Church of God in Christ. Thank you, Brother Clemens, and I am sure the Lord will forgive you for that introduction. I have emphasized and hyphenated the word Pentecost because it is costly, but it's going to cost us our lives. We must be completely transformed by the renewing of our minds. We need a Pentecost in which old men would dream dreams of prophetic dimensions and young men would see visions of world redemption. We need a Pentecost that not only will fall in the upper room, but we need a Pentecost that will fall in the hedges and byways, the lanes and the streets, the alleys, until the Holy Spirit will turn men on and the power of God will soak the earth. We do need a Pentecost. As we go into the highways and the hedges, the streets and the lanes, whoa, as we go by, Skyway, waterways, highways, byways, and flyways. Let us tell the world everywhere, the Comforter has come. The Holy Ghost from heaven, the Father's promise given, will spread the tiding round wherever man is found, the Comforter 
is come. A number of people have observed that where the charismatic renewal loses its ecumenical character, it tends to shrivel up. And yet there are some who want to move in this direction and cultivate a nice, cozy, well-insulated Episcopalian or Catholic or Lutheran or Pentecostal renewal. For they see the vitality of the movement and think, well, that would be nice to uh, bring it in and domesticate it and use it to bolster our denominational program. But the Lord has not brought this renewal to prop up and bless the status quo. He's brought it to advance his program, which is to make us one as he and the Father are one. Christ in you is the hope of glory. And tonight I want to talk about that Christ in you and the Christ in me it's through the power of the Holy Spirit that each one of us is going to come into wholeness, into integration, into that place that we were created to be, that expression of perfect and pure love. Our inheritance in Jesus is wholeness, wholeness of body, wholeness of mind and emotions, and wholeness of spirit. That he desires for each one of us to be whole, a great deal more than we desire it. This is a truth, and this is why James says, when trials and troubles come, don't reject them. When unloving people come, don't reject them. Welcome them as friends, because they come for a purpose. This is when we receive our healing, when we can say, Lord Jesus Christ, bring into my life whatever it takes in order to make me whole. And then if it hurts, say, thank God. Even if it hurts, I know it's for a purpose. The trouble today is not that we are Christians. The trouble is that we are not Christian enough. That's the problem. We have to be Christianized again in depth. And that day they will see that we are something of the Lord shining through us. When I see the misery of my neighbor, I must reach the hand to him and then with him say, praise the Lord. Knowing that if I am hungry, that's a physical fact. But if my neighbor is hungry, that's a moral situation. Let us really enter in the salvation of the world by and through Jesus Christ. Jesus, help me to go and to speak your word and your holy name in the power of your spirit, Christians, Speak, speak powerful in the power of the Spirit. The world is dying because he doesn't know the name of his Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Father. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen, Jesus. We welcome you to our little cell group. <laughs> now hear me, dear Catholics, dear Protestants, uh, independents, non-denominationals, Baptists, everyone. Hear me when I say to you these words. The 
hardest thing to penetrate for God to write holiness into our lives is the religious security and the doctrinal barriers. It's when we have a concept of salvation that says, me and mine. <laughs> Jesus saved my soul. And I often wonder what people meant by that. You know, I got the feeling like there's a soul down here somewhere, and the Lord reached in and saved the soul. I don't know what the soul looked like, but he saved it. You know, there it is. Now, listen a moment. The Lord doesn't want to save your soul. He wants to save your whole life. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's not some mystical thing that he's after. He's after you, dear. Yeah. I want to say to you that holiness, the whole life is holiness, is wrapped up in God making the change from your individualistic concept of what he's doing till the borders of your mind and heart are expanded for you to embrace the change from me to us. All right? Do you know something? The Bible says God has so fashioned the body of Christ that it really doesn't function in all of its power until all the parts are together. How many of you would understand a phrase if I said to you, one of the things that, that tends to, to cause people to lose holiness is what I call a short-timer's attitude. The short-timer's attitude in the military is a disease. If a man is signed up for four years, he does three years, and the last year he's not worth anything because I'm getting out in a year. Now, this is a kind of thing that's going across the body of Christ. Any minute, man, we're going to get out of here. I said, wait a minute. You're not going anywhere till he lets you. Jesus said, Occupy till I come. Do you believe that? Do you believe it? before me with broken hearts and contrite spirits, for the body of my son is broken. Come before me with tears and mourning, for the body of my son is broken. The light is dim, my people are scattered, the body of my son is broken. I gave all I had in the body and blood of my son. It's spilled on the earth. The body of my son is broken. Turn from the sins of your fathers and walk in the ways of my son. Return to the plan of your father. Return to the purpose of your God. The body of my son is broken. The Lord says to you, stand in unity with one another and let nothing tear you apart. 
and by no means separate from one another through your jealousies and bitternesses and your personal preferences, but hold fast to one another because I'm about to let you undergo a time of severe trial and testing and you will need to be in unity with one another. But I tell you this also, I am Jesus, the Victor King, and I have promised you victory. We know that we are called to be one body. We know that we are called to be one as the Father and Son is one. We know that a spirit of unity, the Holy Spirit of God, has been given to us, and that spirit won't rest until we're one. And we can count on that. God's word to us this night as we look forward to pursuing the unity within the body of Christ, as we look forward to, in some way, embodying a more, more mature spiritual awareness, God's word to us is, See me, saith the Lord. But here is a special message. The reason this movement is a movement of power is because God hath brought together two significant ingredients. What God has done in us and is doing in us through the charismatic gifts, through the anointing and the delivering power of the Holy Ghost is exactly what God has created a deep hunger for in the nation. Oh, can you see that? Be still and, and hear what I'm saying. What you and I have experienced is just what God has created a hunger for all across this nation. Folks want to know the reality of God in these secular times. They want to see God showing up. They want to know that God is still with us in this what seems like cursed world. They want to see if God can still act. They want to know if God can still speak. They want to know if God can still heal. They want to know if God can still reveal what God's been doing in our midst like a dime a dozen. Folks all over this nation have a deep hunger to know that God can do that. That's a dynamite situation. The ironic benediction. Yevarecha Adonai Vishmarecha Yaer Adonai Panavelecha Vihunecha Yisa Adonai Panavelecha Via semla ka shalom, yisadonai panavelecha. Via semla ka shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his face upon you and give you peace. B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of Jesus, the Messiah. Amen. <laughs>